Um, but tonight we have um, Michael Kirkland, who is going to be talking about long exposure photography, using long exposures to add interest and creativity to our images. Um, like I was uh, saying, some people, I've, I saw this program a couple of years ago, and I was, uh, I, I believe I learned a lot at the time. So uh, I hope to do some more learning from Michael, because he, uh, he really knows his stuff in this area. Um, let's, uh, I'm going to mute everyone. And um, so Michael, unmute yourself. Uh, got it. Okay, you're unmuted and you can, uh, I will be admitting people as they trickle in. We've got 32 people so far. Just share your screen and welcome. All righty, thank you very much. Okay, uh, hello everyone. And uh, thank you for um, inviting me. I really appreciate it. Um, as we were talking, this is a um, program that uh, I've been doing, uh, <clears throat> I think, um, about six or seven years, maybe even now. Um, and um, long exposure is, is something that I'm very, very fond of. It has really, I think, one thing, if, if nothing else, it, it has forced me to slow down in my photography. And I can really appreciate that. And um, I feel that I can capture better images when I do slow down. Uh, and so, and you'll see as a result uh, what I'm talking about. <clears throat> so um, what I'm gonna cover uh, this evening is, you know, just what long exposure photography is, how and why do we apply long exposures, um, some things you can do to get started using what you already have. And the reason why we wanna use filters and some common use of ND filters. And I'm gonna break down the different types of ND filters and um, talk about, walk you through the steps for applying and using ND filters. I'm gonna transition then into graded, um, graduated neutral density filters. And this section will go quick because we have already will have our foundation for using filters. I'm gonna break down the use of GND filters and talk about how to prevent light leaks, which can occur, and the different brands of filters, and provide some tips and resources for uh, applying long exposure photography. So first, uh, about long exposure photography. Now, um, this image was captured by uh, Louis Daguerre in the 1800s, and you can see it's uh, exposure at around seven minutes. And this is said to be the first um, photograph that actually captured um, a human in the image. Now with this image, this was um, on a very busy boulevard in Paris and there's people you know, up and down the, the boulevard traffic and all, but we can't see it. And it's because of the long exposure. Um, back then, I um, understood that the exposure, the ISO or the ASA was around seven. And so because of that, a lot of light wasn't reaching this, the sensor. And so therefore they needed long exposure. And of course, this was also done on a glass plate. And I would mention that this is the first image to have said had a person in it. And you can see the person is there. A gentleman is getting his shoe shined. And so you can see he was pretty much fixed in that position for the duration of the image. And um, after closer observation it is found that there's another person there. It's a little kid who's peering out the window and he was um, pretty much there for the duration as well. So um, not only um, one image, but or one person, but you can actually see two people in this particular image. So with that, um, Back then they had the ISO or ASA of seven. Why do we um, use long exposure uh, photography today? Well, we use it to capture images in low light conditions, to blur moving objects, create a mysterious, surreal, atmospheric, atmospheric image, um, atmospheric quality to an image, to capture the movement of time in a single image and to reveal, reveal in an image 
what is visible only in the mind's eye. And th that's what I like to go out and do when I'm taking images, capturing images, is basically you know what you want to capture. And although you can't see it right there in front of you, you know by doing a long exposure, the effect it's going to have on the image, whether it's star trails or movement or whatever. So you're capturing really a moment of time in a single image. So what is long exposure photography? Long exposure photography can be described as a technique used to keep the camera shutter open for extended period of time. The goal of a long exposure photo is usually to capture the movement that occurs during an image. Now, long exposure photography is not limited to landscape photography. Long exposure um, is a technique that can be used in various types of photography. And for that, it's only just a matter of finding a creative way to use it in your photographic style. I'm sure you have all have seen long exposure applied um, to water scenes to bring out the texture in the water. And there's no hard and fast rule on the length of the exposures for this, these type of images. It's a matter of how fast the stream or the water is moving the river, if it's meandering or whatever, and just really the effect that you want on the water when you do it. Another way that you've probably pretty familiar with um, long exposure photography is capturing the night skies, the auroras, uh, star trails, or the Milky Way. All of these are different forms of um, long exposure photography. In urban settings, uh, this is where you can be creative. Um, light trails really work really well. Um, in the subway, the train, you can do things even by um, just zooming out with your lens using a longer exposure than needed, you can create some pretty interesting effects as well. Again, what you want to do in your long exposure, the purpose is really to display the motion in an image, whether it's uh, zebras galloping across or um, people in the ice skating rinks um, uh, skating around uh, the people there, or you see the image uh, in Vegas with the street lights and an Olympic National Park um, spinning using uh, steel wool and a lighter, basically. Joe Chindler, Chindler, um, he's someone that I follow, I really admire um, his work and what he does. He's a co-author co -author of a book called Back to Basics, uh, Back to Basics to Fine Art, uh, From Basics to Fine Art. Um, and one of the things that he says as he's describing it is it is not the duration of the exposure that qualifies it as a long exposure photograph, but the intention of capturing moving objects with longer exposure times than necessary that makes a long exposure photograph. And you can see this image captured um, in Tanzania of the Maasai uh, tribe, and they're known for their jumping. And when I was there capturing, capturing the image, I did, you know, captured it with the necessary exposure, but then just to add a different effect, I went with a longer exposure um, to blur it, to show the movement and to see how that would work. So all the images really that you've seen up to this point, um, you could capture with what you already have in your camera bag. Um, just need your camera, um, Actually, using a cable release isn't necessary unless you are going over 30 seconds. I mean, it does help to keep your camera steady so it's not moving and you have nice, sharp, clear images. And you can even use your polarizer filter because it's cutting down um, one stop as well. A tripod is not necessary, but it does come in handy because you have more mobility and um, you can always prop it on a rock or something like that. And that's what I mean by having a tripod. You're going to have more mobility to put your camera in position the way you want it. 
So with all the images that you've seen already um, have been used using, uh, without using filters, why do we use filters? And why are there so many choices of filters? What's the difference in the filters? What do they do? And how do you know which ones to use or to buy? First, let me explain to you, go back and talk about the exposure triangle. You're familiar with the exposure triangle where based on your lens opening or aperture, your shutter speed and your ISO, with those things working in tandem, that's how you achieve your correct exposure. And with that, what will happen is say, for instance, you are wide open to an f2.8 and you're at one five hundredths of a second. Well, based on what you see here, if your aperture can stop down to 16th f16, then the longest exposure you're doing is a one fifteenth of a second. And let's consider that this is an ISO 100 or your lowest ISO. So that option is out too. So working with those three things, your ISO, your aperture, and your shutter speed, you can see where there are limitations to how long of an exposure um, you can, you can uh, produce or how long your shutter speed could be. Now, neutral density, you've probably heard it said that they are um, neutral density filters are sunglasses for your camera. And this is because they are neutral, meaning they do not um, cause a color cast or tint on the scene or the subject that you're capturing. And the density applies to the amount of diffusion that's blocking the light um, from reaching the camera sensor, and it's measured in f-stops. So a neutral density filter, it filters the amount of light reaching the camera sensor without applying a color cast or subject to the um, color cast to the subject or the scene. And this will allow for long exposure times or a wider aperture opening. So now we're adding that fourth element. We have now not only our aperture, ISO, shutter speed, and we also have neutral density filters. And so now with the neutral density filters, it's diffusing the amount of light that's reaching your sensor. And now you can start to use longer shutter speeds and I'll show you how. Some of the typical uses for uh, using neutral density filters in photography, you'll find it used in seascapes to blur moving clouds or moving objects. You find it very often in seascapes to uh, blur moving clouds or even tall grass that's in the foreground. On seascapes, it's used quite often to soften the water and um, make, the, make it smooth in the clouds as well. And in architecture photography, it's very handy because you can make people disappear. Um, with these long exposures I had where the people are in front of the beam and then in front of the University of Chicago, there were people walking in front of my camera, but because of the length of the exposure, it wasn't recording them because they weren't there long enough. Also, wedding photographers and even um, Nature photographers can use it to, um, if they want to use a wider aperture open, opening in order to um, blur out your background. So you can cut down on the light that's reaching your sensor, and that will allow you to open up your um, aperture a little bit more. So now let's talk equipment um, that's needed to you apply the filters. The first thing you're going to find is with your camera body. What's important in, in your camera body is have one that has a bulb setting on it, because you'll find that in long exposure, many of your exposures are going to be over 30 seconds long in order to do a 30 second long bulb setting. And with that, you're also going to need a cable release. The cable release will also allow you to do exposures over 30 seconds long. So that's gonna be required as well. A tripod, you're probably gonna want a tripod so you can compose your image the way you want it. And you can also make sure that your image is gonna be steady 
when you're capturing it. Your lens, you're gonna use a wide angle lens most of the time when you're doing long exposure photography. Most of the time, probably 80% of your images will be with a wide angle lens, somewhere between the 16 and 35 millimeters. Then you have your filters and there's different types of filters. You have your ND filter, you have your GND filters that's in the center in the bottom. And then you have a filter holder that you're gonna to need to hold those filters in place. So let's talk first about the ND filters. There are mainly two types of ND filters that you have. There are the round filters and the square filters. Both of those filters are doing the same thing, but there are cons and pros to each of them. Um, starting with your circular filters, the round ones. With the round filters, what it is, is when you look at your, um, the camera, the filter thread on your camera, it could be uh, 67 millimeters, 77 millimeters, 82 millimeters, um, 92 millimeters. And what will happen is you'll buy that circular filter to fit the thread of that particular uh, lens. But if you switched and go to a different lens with a different filter size, then it's not gonna fit unless you use a step up or a step down ring. And when you have that, it could cause vignetting when you're using the step up or step down ring. The advantage of using a circular screw on filter is you don't have any light leaks. It goes right into the uh, end of your camera lens. And so no light is going to reach your camera sensor or inside your camera to play havoc on your image. And I'll show you how that works as well. So if we go now to the square filters, you'll see the square filters on the um, left, I'm sorry, on the right there, you see you need a filter holder with the square filter. So with the filter, square filter, the advantage of that is now you have this holder that's going to fit right into, um, I'm sorry, the filter is going to fit right into the filter holder. And that's 100 millimeter filter. And so it's going to block um, the center if it's uh, 82 millimeter, 77 millimeter, 67 millimeter, or 92 millimeter. It's going to, um, it's going to fit over that to block the light coming in like you want it to do. What you would do though for the filter holder is you would need again those rings um, and you can see the three rings there that's going to fit on the back of that but with these rings because the filter in itself is 100 millimeters you're not going to have that vignetting and so it's cheaper now for you to buy the square filter and then buy the rings which will cost under $20 for each lens that you have. Um, when I was shooting with Nikon, fortunately the trilogy of lenses they have there, they were all 77 millimeters. So it worked out great. Now I also want to uh, mention, there's also what I call a, um, well, first uh, there's the filter holders. Now with the filters hold holders, you'll see that you can apply, you can put in there the different slots there. So you have your first slot where you can put in your first filter and you can actually have a second or a third filter. So you can actually put in three filters in the holder at one time. And I can talk about it toward the end and you can see where, yes, in some cases, you may want to apply three filters at one time. But um, that I do want you to know that you can't, could put three filters at one time. One thing to keep in mind, you always wanna place your ND filter in the slot closest to your camera lens. And the reason for that is you have a gap there that will allow light leak to come in, light to come in. And with that light leak that's coming in from there, you can, um, it will have an effect on your image. Now, the great thing about a leaf filter is they have like a foam gasket around the filter. And when you drop it into the slot, you can see where it actually 
blocks that light leak, which is really, really nice. So you don't have to worry about the light leak. And so it's kind of giving you, in a sense, the same advantage of a screw-on filter where it's pressed against the um, lens pretty tight and you don't have to worry about a light leak. Now there's uh, what I call as a game changer. There's a company called Breakthrough. Um, I've been purchasing filters from Breakthrough since uh, 2017. And it was when it was a startup company and I was interested in the filters and so I purchased a filter. And as they have upgraded their, pro their products, they have been sending me you know, things to let me know. And so what they have come out with is a magnetic filter, which is to me a game changer. I, I love the magnetic filters because magnetic filters, you can just hold it up there and it'll just kind of suck it right in. And so you have the best of both worlds. You have that nice seal where you don't have the um, any light coming in, but it's also large like the um, 100 millimeter where it can fit on your different lenses. All you need is just the ring adapter adapters. Um, so I, I love it because when I'm out in the field and I'm capturing images and I can take my filter off and change filters and it's very easy. It's not like screwing the filters on and worrying about you know my um, focus being shifted and things like that. So um, I would there's a lot of other companies well, I won't say a lot, but there are other companies now I've noticed that have come out with magnetic filters as well. So, um, and I'll talk more about the different brands and things like that toward the end of the presentation. But that's something you might wanna think about if you're new to going into um, using filters is consider magnetic filters. So with the different types of filters, how do you know which one to use? And you, you can see there on the top illustration where filters go from very light to getting slightly darker. And that's called your densities. And so you can see in the chart right below, you have your filter stops. So like an illustration here, you would have a one stop, two stop, three stop, four stop, five stop. Now you can see there is actually 10 stops. And actually you can even have additional stops because you can have a 15 stop filter or a 16 stop filter based on the different manufacturers. And what the stops are is saying, this is how much the light is being blocked, whether it's one, one stop, and that's your lightest one, all the way to the darker one, in this case of a 10 stop, which you really can't see through. And so you'll find the different manufacturers will have different ways of identifying what filter it is. So keep in mind, you're going from one stop, two stop, all the way down to your 10 stop, and then you'll get to your 15 or 16 stop. Now, one stop to another manufacturer is a uh, 0.3. And to another manufacturer, it's a ND factor of two. Whereas say for instance, your six stop is a optical density of 1.8 and it's a ND factor of eight, I'm sorry, of 64. So the way that works, if you look across, say for the optical density, you can see it increases by 0.3. So it would go three, six, nine, 12, 15, 18, 21, 24, 27, and three or 30. And that corresponds with the stops. And your ND factor is the same way it increases, it doubles in increments. So it goes from two to four, eight, 16, 32, 64, um, 128, um, 256 and so on. And so it just keeps doubling. And so that's how you can know which filter you're using or you wanna purchase. So here's an example. Let's say I'm capturing this image and I go with a three stop filter. For another manufacturer, that would be an optical density of nine because it would go three, six, nine. That's still three stops. For the other manufacturer, which is eight, it would also go from two to four, 
to eight, and that's your three stops. Let's take it again for a six stop. Six stops, if we count six times, three, six, nine, 12, 15, six is 18, 1.8. Same thing with the 64, we will count two, four, eight, 16, 32, and 64 is your sixth stop. So don't be too confused when you see this, just kind of know that breakdown, it's all the same. 10 stops, you're gonna count it the same way all the way up to 10, which is the optical density of three ND factor of 1024. Now I'm sure that um, you've seen use, people use ND filters to capture a ethereal type of image. And the way you do that is you're using here something like your um, 10 or your 16 stop filter because you want a very long exposure time. And you do it in a situation where you have uh, waves crashing against very jagged rocks. That's what's going to create that effect. On the other hand, if you have just a meandering lake or river, even the ocean, and they're just coming in, the water's just coming in and going right back out with the tide, you're gonna create this silky type of a look. So how do you know what exposure to use? This is something that when you purchase a Lee ND filter, you, you get one of these cards. They have a three stop filter. I'm sorry, they have a little stopper, which is six stops, a big stopper, which is 10 stops. And then they have a, their super stopper, which is the 15 stops. So let's say for instance, um, we take our initial um, image exposure and it's 30 seconds. If we're using a six stop filter and we look over from 30 seconds, I'm sorry, a 30th of a second, I apologize. So we're at a 30th of a second and we look over using a six stop filter, we can see that it's two seconds. That, was, that would be the recommended exposure. If we were using the big stop filter, which is 10 stops at a 30th of a second, now we're talking about a 30 second exposure. If we had on the super stopper, which is 15 stops at 1 30th of a second, now we're talking about a 16 minute exposure. So that's how you will calculate it. And like I said, with Lee, it comes with the card and you can just take your initial reading and then you can see, well, based on whatever filter you're using, that's what you want to set your exposure to. They also have that in an app for your phone that you can use. And it corresponds exactly to that chart. Uh, other manufacturers that have filters, they have the apps as well. It's also on some of the other um, photography apps that uh, we use in the field as well. The TPE and other um, apps. So you can see here, um, these are a couple images I use, you know, I capture in the city and just using um, your ND filter because I wanted a longer exposure in order to record in the first image, the blur of the traffic. And then in the other images, I wanted to see the light pattern going up and down the street. So these images were actually taken at dusk or, or dawn um, actually, the first image, it was pretty bright out when I took it, but with me putting the filter on it, I was able to slow down my shutter speed quite a bit so I could see the movement in the traffic. Otherwise, it would just froze the traffic. Here's an image that I captured up, up in Michigan, <clears throat> excuse me, at uh, St. Joseph Harbor. I took the uh, initial image to get my exposure. I knew I was gonna put a filter on it and you can see my exposure at ISO 100. You always wanna to try to start with your lowest ISO. 
So using my um, ISO of 100, I went to, um, I was at an F9 and it was one tenth of a second. Once I put my uh, 10 stop filter on at um, still F9, 100 ISO, it was a 108 second exposure. So I like that you can see the difference in the water and you can see the difference in the clouds. I like that I like how the sun was setting. So I stuck around and then I said, oh, wow, um, the light is really going down really nice. I dropped my ISO down even to uh, 31 and it went a 15, F15 and I did a 25 second exposure. And then when I looked at that, I said, well, the light in the lighthouse is going around. I wanna see if I can capture it going around two times. And so I was able to go up to 39 seconds and now you can see how it lit up the light in the lighthouse very well. And I, I like that, and I, but I wasn't content because I said I can do a little bit better on this image. So I did some light painting. I just took out my flashlight and I just waved it in front of the uh, lighthouse there on the side facing you to open up the shadow there. And um, so that's a long exposure with light painting. Here's a couple other images that I captured. And again, first you want to capture your initial image to see what your shutter speed is. And then using your uh, filter, you do your, your calculations to see what filter you're going to put on. So with the 10 stop filter, it went from 1 25th of a second to 40 seconds. And you can see how it really smoothed the water out and the clouds really weren't moving that much. So they kind of stayed in place for the most part, but it smoothed the water out really nice. And, you know, maybe you do like the first image, but the great thing about filters, you know, you, you have them there in your bag, try it and see, and you can decide later. And that's what I do quite often. Here's another case where I did a four tenths of a second exposure and then I applied my filter using um, a 10 stop filter and I got it to 38 seconds. And then I even, I think put my 15 on there, uh, ND 15, and I was able to get 117 seconds out of my exposure. So what are, <coughs> excuse me, what are the steps for, um, actually setting up the camera and taking pictures. So what you want to do is go ahead and place your camera on a tripod, get your shot composed just the way you want it. Set your desired aperture and you want to have it on aperture priority. Go ahead and put your um, camera to 100 ISO, focus and take your picture and take note of your shutter speed. Once you have, you've taken note of your shutter speed, you know what filter you want to use. You go to your chart and let's say in this case, we're going to use our six stop, six stopper, little stopper. So it's six stops with a little stopper. And we said we were at um, a 15th of a second. So now at a 15th of a second, we're now we look at it with our little stopper, we should set it to four seconds. So now we will go back and now I'm at number six here and place the camera setting settings on focus, um, camera settings and focus to manual. So take it off of your aperture priority, put it on manual, make sure your focus is on manual and you wanna apply your new shutter speed that we said was four seconds. Go into live view and zoom in and focus manually um, to get it tack sharp the way you want it. Then you go ahead and apply your ND filter because if you have a, um, based on which filter you use, you won't be able to see through the filter. And if you have it on autofocus, your focus is gonna start hunting for it to try to find the focus through that filter. Once you have your filter in place, go ahead and take the picture. 
Again, if your shutter speed is over 30 seconds, you want to go ahead and put that on bulb mode in order to use your um, cable release to do it as long as you want. You might ask about um, variable ND filters, if you're familiar with those. A variable ND filter, um, it can adjust the range of light and it goes from one stop to eight stops. Um, other brands will even go higher than that. But the problem with a variable filter is it is basically two polarizing filters that you're using and you're turning those to diffuse the light or allow more light to come in. So the thing about them is they aren't color neutral and they actually have a strong color cast um, on them. You know, so if you're doing, you know, black and white images, maybe it doesn't matter. And so you can go ahead and you can um, get one of these filters or ND filters instead of buying multiple um, ND filters. But there's another problem that gets makes it much worse. It's called an X factor. And this occurs around 24 millimeters or wider. And again, remember I was saying that 80% of your images are going to be with the wide angle lens from 16 to 35 millimeters. So you can see here where from 24 millimeters or wider, you're going to have this occur. When you do open it up to, you know, um, 25 mill millimeters, the image, it'll start to disappear where you ha won't have that anymore. And it'll disappear completely at around 30 millimeters. But when you're at the other um, end at 24 millimeters and wider, that's when you have to worry about getting this X factor. So um, that's what I would say about um, variable ND filters. They're good for people doing video, but not so much the photographer. So at this point, I'm going to switch over to talk about GND filters. Um, are there any questions um, in terms of the ND filters? that I can address? Uh, there's not, nobody in the chat yet. Okay. Um, I ha Actually, I had a question. Sure. Um, the magnetic filters are like, the, are there any uh, holders that can use like the regular filters, you know, without bu you buying now a whole new set of magnetic filters? Um, or no, or you got to buy new filters. Well, well, uh, well okay. <laughs> uh, fortunately, the company that I purchased mine through Breakthrough, they, you know, they're always increasing their technology. And actually, they said, you send your old filters back, and we'll replace them. Oh, awesome. which is what they did. I don't know if they're still doing that because. I've been with them for a while and when they were a startup company. And so I'm kind of their guinea pig or whatever. And because even now, I don't think their magnetic filters are on the market. They're not selling them because they are making a change to them. And the change is they're doing it so you can stack the filters without, you know, vignetting, of course. And so, um, because of that, they've stopped selling them, but there are ways that you can still get them. But to answer your question, I really don't know um, if you can do that. And the problem that I see from using it and from having them is that filter is a much larger filter size. It's 95 or I think it's like 90 millimeters. And so I don't know if your ring is going to fit on it. It has to fit the ring and that's the thing. So um, I don't have any screw on filters because I didn't use fil screw on filters. I use the square ones. So I won't be able to try it because I don't have any screw on filters. Okay. So, not sure. Yeah, I, had, uh, I, I thought I had seen somewhere, some kind of product where, you know, you could use the filter that you had with their adapter and it would it would do that 
magnetic just clicks on kind of thing but i i i don't remember now this is a while back so. yeah i mean you, you could be right uh, about that because like i guess i do receive um information from different companies that's coming out now with magnetic filters and i haven't tried um any of the other companies and it's because of the ironclad guarantee and all that breakthrough has you can still buy their filters by the way um but their filters have a 25 year guarantee um and they won't get scratched they'll replace it you know and so um with that i have been with them and they say that their filters are the most color neutral filters out and i have to agree with that i haven't seen any color cast and that's something I will talk about too toward the end of the presentation. Uh, one more thing, uh, uh, not a question, but um, I have I have one of those apps that you mentioned. Uh, it's called LE Calculator for, mm -hmm. for my iPhone or Long Exposure Calculator, sure. if anybody was interested in the actual name. And it's a free app, you know, it's got ads, but basically, yeah, you just tell it, what was your normal shutter speed? how many stops and the filter are you putting on? And then it tells you what's your new shutter speed. Yeah, and, and Lee, um, you won't get any ads or anything. And, you know, it doesn't matter who's filtered because it's still looking at those numbers. When it's all, only thing it's looking at is what your current shutter speed is. And based on what number of filter you have, what your new shutter speed should be. Okay. Okay. Cool. Did any anything come in? Any other questions? All right. All right. Keep. Let's keep going. Okay then. All right. So G and um, G and D filters, graduated neutral density filters. Why do we use those? Graduated entry, graduated neutral density filters will help to control dynamic range. Dynamic range is the, the range from light to dark in a scene. So with the human eye, we can see roughly about 22 stops. So things from the, we look in the clouds and we can see the puffy clouds, we can see the detail in the puffy clouds and we can look down um, on the ground and we can see in the dark areas and the shadows, we can see information there as well. Now your digital camera, um, they are improving quite a bit. So let's say um, a digital camera can record 15 or 14 stops of light. Well, if your sunrise, your sunset is about 17 stops of light. Well, your digital camera cannot see or record everything in that particular scene for a sunrise sunset because it exceeds the range of the digital camera. Whereas indoor photography, you see we never really have that problem because it doesn't get that light indoors where it's blaring like it is outside. And so your digital camera can record all the uh, values of light within um, the indoors. So, if we're capturing an image at sunrise or sunset and it's 17 stops of light, but our camera is only recording um, 14 stops of light, that's where we would apply filters. So let's say a two stop filter from the 14, it's gonna give me a 16 stops of light. But if I do a three stop filter, now it's taking me out to the 17 um, and it's exceeding the sunrise or sunset. So that's how the filters will work. So you can see here, this is an image um, captured at the Grand Canyon. And you can see what I was talking about, the clouds. Um, you can see all the detail in the clouds from the image below, but in the image above, not using a filter, the camera could not record all of that information. But once I put my ND filter on there, it toned down those highlights and that way it allowed me to capture the full range of detail. 
So the way um, graduated neutral density filters work is first, you have to have the holder. So whether you're using the screw on filters or the square filters, you would use the holder and you would put the filters in those slots. And that's why I was saying there's three slots. So if you're using the square ND filter, you could have that in that first slot. And then the next two slots, you can use um, your GND filters, or you could even use another ND filter. Say you had a three-stop ND filter and you had a six-stop ND filter where you wanted to do a 10-stop. So you would have two ND filters, and then you could still have a gradated filter in there as well. You won't be able to see anything through the camera, trust me, but it can be done. And I have done it actually. Um, and there are two different types, for the most part, primarily two different types. You have your hard and your soft filters. And the filters at the top or bottom, depending on which way you turn it, one is going to be light and then the other is going to be dark. So you can see you have your hard edge filter and then your soft edge filter. So which one do you use and when do you use it? Well, if you have a scene like this where I was capturing an image of Chicago and I had the buildings, you know, coming from the horizon, now I want to gradually bring that down to tone down the background behind the images, behind the buildings. So I would use my soft filter in this case. Now I went to the lakefront and I'm looking out across the lake and I have that hard edge there, so to speak, I can use my hard filter and put it right on the horizon. And that way um, it's really, it'll stop right there at the horizon with the darkness and leaving the other part of it intact. So that's where you use your hard and soft images or situations such as that. So here is a, a scene that was captured and you can see for me to capture this image the way it is because my camera can't read all those stops of light. I ha don't have a filter on there. That's what it would look like. Once I have my filter on there, my GND filter on the front of the lens, front of the lens, you can see in the back of the camera, you can actually see what the GND filter is doing. Now those clouds are really coming out and it really doesn't affect um, the foreground image. Here's another situation where I did the same thing. Um, in this particular situation, I wanted the lights to really come out. And you can see how light it is out, outside at the time I captured this image. But with the ND filter on there, with a GND filter on there, I was able to really cut that down and really make it like it was really dark out and gave it time for those lights to really pop out. There's also what is called a reverse ND filter, GND filter. And the way that works is when you're doing a sunrise or a sunset, the sun is really bright right there on the horizon. It'll come down you adjust it to right on the horizon and you can see it's darker right in the center of this filter. And then as you work your way up, it gradually graduates lighter, whereas the bottom is clear. And so with the effect that you have, you're only really affecting what you want, the lighter parts of the image. Here's some other examples I was talking about sunrise and sunset where I used the, um, the reverse GND filter. There is, um, when you're using long exposures, you can have noise. In fact, inside your camera, there are, you can turn on the noise reduction, you can turn it on and off. So the in-camera noise reduction, the way it actually works is you would capture your image and then it would close down your shutter, take another image and it will look at the difference in the pixels of where the light and the grain hot pixels are. 
and they would remove those in your image. So you can see the one image here that's on the uh, left, six minutes and 12 seconds. If I was using my um, uh, noise reduction, I've now increased that to 12 minutes and 24 seconds. The other one, five minutes and six seconds, it would increase it to a 10 minute and 12 second exposure because it would capture that image and then it would right after that capture another image with the shutter being closed, now allowing any light to come in. And it's gonna be for the same duration of time. So I personally would not uh, recommend using your noise reduction. I would turn that off, you know, mainly for that reason, but also there's a lot of post-processing software out there that can really do it in one step and it doesn't take any time. I use uh, Nick and I go through define, I hit define and it just does it automatically. So, um, and there's a lot of other um, softwares out there as well. So I would really suggest um, doing it that way as opposed to the in-camera noise reduction. But, you know, I would say try it for yourself and see, you know, how it works. Here's a, another image that I captured. And like I said, when you're setting up, you always wanna capture the image first without your filters. Look at your calculator, then you would put the filter on and it will tell you um, how long of exposure you need. So in this, it was three tenths of a second. And I put my um, 10 stop ND filter on with a soft GND and it increased my exposure to 335 seconds. And again, it's, you know, maybe you like the fluffy, fluffy cloud, clouds and you like that, you know, but, you know, try both ways and see, and you can decide later. So I was going to talk about light leaks. Light leaks can occur um, a couple of different ways. You know, here you see there's a little light leak ghosting there down on the corners. And if you're doing a 30 second exposure, you probably won't even notice that when you're looking through your camera and you would find it once you got home and start processing your image. Now, if you did say a four minute exposure, then you will really see it that way. And now you know something is wrong. And what is wrong is normally when we capture an image, we're standing behind our camera. And so the eyepiece there is being blocked because our face is there. And there's no light, of course, coming through the back of your head that's going to reach that uh, opening in the, in the lens. I'm sorry, in your uh, camera. And so that's why you could have light coming in there when you're no longer behind the camera, standing off to the side while you're waiting for a four second or four minute exposure. And then light is coming and it's bouncing all around and that's what will happen. So all you really need to do is you can take a piece of tape. Um, some people will carry just a piece of black tape with them and they'll put that over the eyepiece or they'll put, you know, I carry a towel also. You could lay that over the eyepiece I've seen people put their camera strap over it just to kind of block it or their cap, whatever the case. And once you do that, that prevent the light from coming in and affecting your image. And remember um, when we were talking about ND filters, I was talking about the gaps between your um, lenses, I'm sorry, between your filters. So I was saying that, you know, you always wanna make sure that you put your ND filter closest to the camera. And if you don't have the leaf filter that has the foam gasket on it, you see you're gonna have that gap there. And then if you put a ND filter or a second or a third filter in front of it, now you have the gap. So we're looking down on this camera. And so we're the sun. And so the sun is going through there and it's hitting your, um, the different filters and bouncing light back and forth. And this is a type of effect that you can get from that coming in. A couple of different ways I shield it. As I said, I've seen people, um, you know, hold up their hats to, to do it. I usually do wear a cap, so I'll do that quite a bit. 
just hold my cap up. As long as I'm just blocking the sun from going down in there, that's fine. Um, something else I've come up with that my friends have um, called the Kirkland cloak. And I just have a little towel that I carry with me and one of those midden clips. And I just put that and secure it around my filter. And now a lot of places I go to, it can be a little windy. I don't have to worry about it blowing off. Here's another example of what I was talking about. Um, you know, capture images different ways. You know, one fiftieth of a second, I had the nice puffy clouds and it looks really, really nice. And I want to just give it a shot and see what happens with a eight second exposure and then a 30 second exposure. I'm using a combo of filters, filters there, ND filter and um, a GND filter. Here again, um, just a couple examples of different ways you can do it. You're gonna to have to take that first image initially anyways. So you have that. And then once you put your filter on there and you can see you know, which one you like better later, but at least you have them both to choose from. I also encourage you, you know, when you're doing to look around, you know, check different perspectives to see um, if there's another way that you can, you know, capture an image. I'm sure you've seen um, the top image of Zion National Park um, going down the river there. And it's one that, that you see everyone, you know, do all the time when they go there. But um, I've had done that a few times. So I went underneath there and I was trying something different. I saw this little uh, creek coming in and feeding in. That was a great opportunity for me to do a long exposure um, image to, you know, see how that's going to look. And, you know, I kind of like the effects of that as well. So as I wrap up, I um, want to um, do a little bit of a review of why do we use um, filters? Well, for ND filters, we use them to reduce the amount of light that reaches the camera sensor without applying a color cast to the scene. This will allow for long exposure times or wider aperture openings. Whereas GND filters will help to control dynamic range. There's a lot of different filter brands out there. Uh, Koken, Tiffin, BMW, uh, Oya is, I would, um, depending on, on your budget, um, well, can depend on which filters, but for me, um, I pay a lot of money for my lenses. And so, um, and it's because I want good glass. So I'm gonna make sure that when I purchase filters, I'm gonna get good glass as well. So I try to buy um, the better filters and whether it's um, with the um, GND filters, the long um, 100 by 150 filters, they come in resin, which is a plastic, or they come in glass. And you can get the resin coat uh, filters right now um, pretty inexpensively. Um, I don't like them because over time, um, you know, you have to really be careful, but you, you can get scratches on them. But if you're starting out and you wanna try some filters out, you don't know if you really wanna get into it, you don't wanna spend a lot of money, then I, I would say that's a really good place to start. Um, getting the resin filters, but um, for the most part, I would try to go with the glass filters. And there's a few companies that have the glass filters. Um, I've used the uh, Format High Tech Breakthrough. I've used Lee. Um, the others I haven't used in the glass filters. Those are the three that I would recommend. In fact, um, here are some manufactured claims you see uh, the BMW, um, their manufacturer claim is the physical reasons for very dense filters poses a warm tone, which can be compensated in image editings. As I was saying, you know, filters, you can have a color cast when you use them. So that's what you wanna kind of watch out for. And so they're telling you right now, yeah, it's gonna be a little warm, just correct it in Photoshop or whatever. High tech format, 
their claim is to be the world's first hyper neutral ND. With Firecrest, we now offer the most neutral ND filter on the market. These glass filters are hyper neutral across all visible light spectrums. Um, in uh, format, um, high tech is one of the filters that I really enjoy using. I do agree with that. They do have some very, very sharp filters. Um, I'm sorry, not sharp filters, but uh, neutral dens density filters. Um, they do have the glass ones. They also have the resin. And those are the ones that I wouldn't recommend unless you just want to start out to see if there's something you want to do. For Lee, they let you know that the blue cast is inherent in the big stopper and we do pre-warn you um, in the instruction book so basically this is what you're going to get you need to go into your um, software and make that adjustment uh, a lot of times people are using filters for um, monochrome images anyway so sometimes it's not really a big deal whereas breakthrough they claim to be the world's sharpest and most color neutral filter guaranteed and um, I do kind of um, stand behind them when they say that because I've been using their filters for quite a bit for quite a while and yes I will say that they are color neutral and one filter I did get a scratch in and I sent it back and it was replaced so they do um, live up to the guarantee. Here are a couple long exposure photographers that I really, really appreciate their work. I like what they're doing. I've followed them. Um, and uh, so there's um, some um, that you might want to uh, follow as well if you're interested in doing some long exposure um, photography. Here, <coughs> excuse me, here are some of the resources, some phone apps um apps for long exposure and for night for, uh, photography as well um, you're probably familiar with a lot of them you have uh photo pills there's a moon calendar um, there's because i do uh night photography i do use these different apps because you want to know um, when you're going out to photograph the auroras or the milky way um, if the moon is out or not because um, that's not good because you want Want it to be dark and the with the moon being out with all the light from the moon you're going to have um, images is not not quite as uh, vibrant um, sky maps to find a milky way and all of that you have the depth of field calculator the aurora uh, app long exposure calculators um, the tpe lease filter indies um, so there's there's quite a bit of apps out there for, for photographers that can help you with your filters and a couple of books um, that I really like. Um, it's a complete guide of long exposure to long exposure, and this is Joel Chingelar, who I really um, like his work. I like finding um, what he's doing, and he goes through processing as well as um, the composition and, and all as well. From basics to fine art, black and white photography, architecture and beyond, Joel Chinchillar and Julia Anna Gastrolupu, I believe, um, just uh, went to one of her workshops, in fact, a couple of years ago. She does really, really great work. Um, and um, I would suggest that you might want to look at to see what she's doing as well. So in closing, uh, Planning is the key. It's good to have an idea of what you want your image to look like when you go out. That's one of the things I do. Um, when I'm carrying my equipment to do my long exposure, I'm already looking for clouds or the water because I know um, what I want my image to look like um, with the movement of the water or the clouds in the sky. Um, there's more to capturing an image than making sure that your exposure is correct. It's not always about depth of field. Making your shutter speed a priority can produce some uh, very creative results. What I like about a long exposure photography, it 
allows me to really kind of slow down and I've been studying my different perspective options, which is really nice. Um, and that's what I would encourage you to do as well is look around to see if there's any other options while your image is processing. If you have your camera set up on the tripod for three or four minutes, well, during that three or four minutes, I walk around to see if there's anything else I wanna capture or capture that image from a different perspective. It could just be a matter of raising a lure on my tripod. So some tips to remember to create some sharp images and to avoid light leaks. Make sure to switch your camera to manual and you wanna focus before you apply your ND filter. For precise focusing, you wanna use your live view and zoom in 100%. You wanna be sure to cover the eyepiece and the filter holder slots to avoid any light leaks. Always place an ND filter in a slot closer to your camera lens. Avoid camera shake by using a sturdy tripod and a cable release. Keep in mind, producing one great image is better than 10 good images. And don't forget you're outdoor having fun you know, doing what you enjoy doing. So, you know, have fun. So I appreciate you. Thank you for your interest. And if you want to see more of my images, you can follow me on my website um, or on white uh, light chase photography. I do photo tours through them. And Instagram, I have MJ Kirkland Images, Silhouette Chicago and Sculpting Water. So thank you very much.